Safita, are you ready to go? Um, yes, ma'am, we are ready to go. I'm still looking to see if we have uh, all of the committee members on the meeting, and I don't see a lot of them. OK. Oh. <clears throat> I know that John Blunt uh, and um, Lloyd Smith, they will probably not be in attendance. They've got a conflicting meeting, uh, but they said if they could step in and out, they would. So I, I don't think they'll be here today. Sure, thank you. And Miss Escobar said, uh, Zian Escobar um, said that she'll be running a little bit behind. OK. We can give everybody a few minutes if you'd like or. Just. A couple of more minutes, if you don't mind, please. I um, Absolutely. We, are, we are ready for the meeting. It's just that I don't see uh, all of them yet. OK, OK. Thank you so much. Sure. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Um, I mean, good afternoon, committee members. This is Savida Bandi, Planning Department staff. I welcome everyone to the fourth virtual livable place committee meeting. And we are already recording the meeting and uh, co-chairs, we're ready to commence the meeting. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Savida. It is 3.02 on Tuesday afternoon, uh, December 8th, and we are going to call this virtual meeting uh, using Teams meeting to, to order. I'd like to let you know that we will have, can have public speakers and we'll allow them to speak at the end of the meeting, and we'll have two minutes for each uh, public speaker. Um, when you are not speaking, please, if you would cut your uh, mics off and your cameras camera off. Camera off camera camera camera. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Oh, I guess somebody's mic. So that's a good example of what happens when the mics are left on. So if you wouldn't mind, please uh, cut those off when you're not using them. If you're joining us by phone, you can hit star six to mute and unmute yourselves. And committee members, if you all would like to speak, you can either use the raise your hand feature, and that is just for the committee members, or you can uh, cut your mic on, state your last name, and then I'll call on you um, when I get the opportunity. OK, so we're going to move along and I'm going to uh, call the roll. And if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself and saying your last name and present, I would appreciate it. Uh, so. I am here, your co-chair Lisa Clark, co-chair Sonny Garza. Present. John Blunt, I don't believe is here. Antoine Bryant. Present. Toby Cole. Cole is present. Thank you, Steve Curry. Curry, present. Thanks, Curtis Davis. Mr. Davis. Present. Thank you. Mike Dishberger. Aye. Uh, here. Zion Escobar. Present. Thank you. Robert Federlin. Federlin. Correct me when you speak, please. Robert. Okay. Peter Friedman. 
Peter's here. Thank you. Luis Guajardo. Luis is here. Thank you. Gwen Guidry. Gwen. Okay. Omar Isfar. Omar. Ron Lindsay. Present. Thank you. Kirby Lou. Kirby. Okay. Present. Thank you, Kirby. Meg Lusto. Lusto present. Thank you. Johanna Ma Mahmoud. Mahmoud present. Mahmoud, thank you. Dustin O'Neill. Katie Payton, Kathy Payton, excuse me. Kathy Payton is present. Thank you. Megan Siegler. Siegler present. Thank you. Dr. Sherry Smith. Smith is present. Thanks. Juan Sorto. Juan. All right, Sandy Stevens. Stevens is present. Thank you. Bobby Tyson. Bobby. Okay. Fernando Zamaripa. Correct me if I mispronounced that, please. Fernando. Zamaripa here. Great. Thank you. Okay. So roll call is complete. Thank you, everyone. Okay, um, uh, um, I'm sorry. Lisa, this is Omar as far I just jumped in, I'm not, not sure if you. Ah, thank you, Omar. Did I, anyone else come in uh, and miss their name on the roll call? Okay. All right, just a few virtual meeting um, policies or procedures uh, to follow. Again, please keep your mic and your camera off when not in use so that that will help the quality of our, our um, meeting. Um, if you wish to speak again, if you're a committee member, raise your hand or state your last name and I'll call on you. If you're using a cell phone, star six to unmute yourself or to, or to mute yourself. Um, and when I call on you, if you would not mind, please state your name clearly as with this as a recorded meeting and spell out your last name. Um, all right. If you are interested in more virtual meeting details, you can find those on the HoustonPlanning.com website. And I will now hand the uh, meeting over to Director Margaret Wallace Brown. Good afternoon, committee members. Thank you, uh, Chairperson uh, Lee Clark and Sunny. Good to see both of you here today. I am grateful that um, all of you here today are giving your two hours to us. Uh, these are very important issues that we're going to discuss today, and I look forward to a um, an open and a robust conversation. I want to let you know that um, we'll say this again throughout the meeting, but please keep Let's Talk Houston .com on um, your browser favorites, and um, you'll be asked to go to that website and put in information and um, answer survey questions as we go through this process. So let's talk Houston.com. That's for both committee members and the general public. We want to hear from the public as well. If you have any questions, you can always call the planning department at 832-393-6600, or you can visit our website directly at HoustonPlanning.com. I don't have any other announcements today, so let's get busy. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Savita, I believe you are going to take over right now. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so for today's meeting, this is the agenda for today's meeting and good afternoon everyone. My name is Savita Bandi. We'll have, uh, so we are done with the director's report and um, today we'll be making a presentation on the residential buffering ordinance and it will be presented by Mushen. 
Moshen Fang. After that, we'll present some concerns brought to us, followed by discussion. Include with homework activities and expectations for next meeting. There will be time left for questions and public comments in the end. Next slide, please. So here is a timeline of where we are today. As you can see that uh, we completed the November meeting and during the November meeting we established consensus. Next slide, please. Um, we established consensus on the issues that this committee will be handling throughout um, the next couple of years. And um, as you can see on the screen, you'll see the list of uh, items that we discussed last time. For today's meeting, like we said, we will discuss the ordinance requirements, or the buffering, residential buffering ordinance requirements, and then concerns followed by discussion. Um, OK, so let's get started. This is the outline of today's presentation. Um, next slide, please. Savita, if I may interrupt, this is Tammy Williamson. Sean Masek, standing in for Dustin O'Neill, I believe has joined the meeting. OK. Um, Mad uh, Madam Chair, can you please um, recognize? Could you say could you say the name one more time for me, please? Sean Masek okay. or Dustin O'Neill. OK, so Sean Masek has joined us in uh, taking Dustin O'Neill's seat for today. This is Director Wallace Brown again. I do want to interrupt and, and note and note that um, Council Member Sally Alcorn's office has a representative here also. So we are we Wonderful. are joined by the council member's office. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Brown, and thanks for joining us. We always appreciate it when a council member or their staff attend the meetings. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Can we go to the next slide, please? OK, so this is the outline for today's meeting. We will be talking about the residential buffering and what it means. Why was it introduced? What are the existing ordinance regulations and some of the concerns followed by discussion? By the end of the meeting, we should be able to answer this question. Can we move to the next slide, please? Residential buffering means the buffer provided while provide while developing high density structures adjacent to single family residential developments. The city continues to grow and with the uptick in population, city has seen an increase in the number of high density and um, sorry, high developments. While we expect the city to grow and the growth to happen, it is important to make sure that the residential neighborhoods are not adversely affected. Because Houston is so unique with no zoning or land use regulations, we need special tools to protect our residential neighborhoods. When city saw an increase in the number of high, high rise developments proposed in close proximity to existing single family residential homes, residential buffering ordinance. All of this ties back to the goals identified in Plan Houston and Resilient Houston, like city that builds up but not out. To promote sustainable growth, address traffic concerns, and to reduce high cost of housing plus transportation, city must encourage denser developments. However, in doing so, we must be mindful of existing residential developments and protect them from getting adversely affected. It is a balancing act. So if a high rise development is immediately adjacent or within 30 feet of the single family residential lots, then a buffer must be provided. We will get to the details of all these requirements shortly. I just want to cover just one more thing before we get to the current regulations. Next slide, please. Along with the residential buffering ordinance, Eight major activity centers referred to as MACs were created. Major activity centers were introduced as pilot areas where residential buffering ordinance does not apply. The reason these areas were created is because they have high density mixed use developments and have potential to become 
further busy urban centers with less than 3% single family residential development and adjacent to freeways or transit corridor streets. On the screen, you can see one of the MAC areas and um, also you can see the criteria. For example, it should contain either two major thoroughfares or it should abut a freeway or a tollway or a transit corridor street. It should at least be or 400 acres of land. Um, it should have more than uh, 10 million square foot of gross floor area developed as other than single family. Um, number of single family residential development should be um, less than 3%. The area cannot have uh, non contiguous tracts, and the area contains properties used for two or more other than single family uses, like office, commercial, institutional, or multifamily. Next slide, please. I'm going to show a visual of this, the same MAC area you're looking at, which is Greenway Plaza. Next. So here you can see this is a view of Richmond which is a transit corridor at this location, looking west from Buffalo Speedway with, within the Greenway Plaza activities, uh, major activity center. As you can see, the area is predominantly developed with users other than single family residential and can support more high density developments. Now you just, um, previous slides, you saw one example of a major activity center. This is a map which is um, identifying all the eight major activity centers that were introduced as pilot areas when the buffering ordinance was implemented in 2011. With that, I would uh, want to introduce Moshen Fang, who is very knowledgeable and has led successfully the Walkable Places Committee. And um, she is with us today to share about residential buffering ordinance. So thank you, Moshen, and over to her. Thank you, Savita. Good afternoon, committee members. Um, this is Moshen Fong with planning department. It's my pleasure to discuss the residential buffering ordinance with you today. Uh, we know this ordinance is very important component to create and preserve livable places. Um, committee members, as we all know, Houston is becoming denser. The city has been trying to develop sustainable urban centers to address the density. Walkable places and transit oriented development ordinance, complete street and transportation plan, Vision Zero, are some of the recent efforts we have made to balance the important relationship between transportation, land use, and urban form. The residential buffering ordinance was adopted even before these efforts. It aims to accommodate density for the city to grow while minimizing the potential negative impacts imposed on the existing single family residential neighborhoods. However, since the ordinance was adopted in 2011, we have heard concerns from the residents that the ordinance has not effectively protected the, go back to the last slide, please. Um, Evan, thank you protect the residential neighborhoods in the urban area. In the following session, I would like to briefly go over the residential buffer standards as well as the related concerns and challenge with you. We would like to take this opportunity to revisit the ordinance and find out ways to improve the ordinance and help the city grow responsibly uh, sustainably. During my presentation, I will pause at the end of each topic to allow you time to ask questions or share your comments. Therefore, I respectfully ask you to hold your questions to the end of each topic. So the, on the screen, the residential buffering ordinance, as you can see, um, creates three sets of buffering standards to protect adjacent single family residential homes. These three standards are residential buffer area standards, garage screening standards, and lighting fixture standards. The residential buffer area standards only apply to abutting developments meeting certain criteria. However, garage screening standards and lighting fixture standards apply to all abutting developments within the city limit. Next slide, please. So what is an abutting development? According to the ordinance definition, 
And abutting development should not be used or restricted to single family residential use. And it is directly abutting or within 30 feet of a single family residential property. The definition also includes a section for certain structures developed with permanent access easements. That section covers very unique situation and creates some technical confusion. We may not need to, uh, we may need to amend that part of the definition to avoid confusions. We will discuss the details with you in the next meeting when we talk about other potential amendments. Now let's see some. Um, here are some examples Ma, of. Mushin, may I interrupt, please? Yes. Um, we have some background noise. Uh, it's like somebody tapping on a table. Um, please keep all your microphones mute. I request all the attendees and participants to mute their microphones. Um, so we all can very clearly listen to this very important presentation. Thank you so much. Sorry, Moshian, go ahead, please. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Devin, please go to the next slide. Yes. So on the screen, the parcel in pink is a non single family residential development. Uh, immediately to the west are some single family residential lots which are, are in blue. Therefore, the pink parcel is an abutting development. Next slide, please. On this example, the pink parcel is a non single. Uh, seven, I think you are ahead of me. <laughs> Go back to the previous slide, please. Yeah. So on this example, the pink parcel is a non single family residential development. Immediately to the west is a 30 feet alley. Um, on the other side of the alley are some single family residential lots. Even though it's not immediately abutting, it's within 30 feet of single family residential properties. Therefore, the pink parcel is an abutting development. Next slide, please. On this example, the same uh, non single family residential development in pink is adjacent to a street wider than 30 feet to the north. Across the street are some single family residential homes. Since the distance between the single family residential house and the pink parcel is larger than 30 feet, the pink parcel is not an abutting development for, single, for the single family house across the street. In brief, the buffering standards we are going to discuss only apply to abutting development. Um, and abutting development has very specific meanings here. Not every development adjacent to single family residential house is an abutting development. Please keep that in mind. Next slide, please. Now let's go over the residential buffer area standards. The ordinance requires an abutting development to provide a buffer area adjacent to the single family residential properties if meeting all the five criteria listed on the screen. They are one, the abutting development must be greater than 75 feet in height. Two, it must be adjacent to or taking access from a public street other than a major thoroughfare or transit corridor street. Three, it is not located in a major activity center. Four, majority of the adjacent single family retention lots are greater than 3,500 square feet. And five, minimum 60% of a property line adjacent to single family residential lots uh, is greater than 3,500 square feet. So next slide, please. I'm going to go over each of these criteria with you. The first criteria um, sets the height requirement. Only abutting developments greater than 75 feet in height are required to provide a buffer area adjacent to single family residential homes. 75 feet in height doesn't mean the height of the whole building uh, is 75 feet. According to the ordinance, the height of a structure shall be measured from grade to the finished floor of the highest habitable floor or the highest floor of a par parking garage. Therefore, the actual building could be greater than 75 feet. So why 75 feet and why not just measure the actual height of the building? The 75 feet in height criteria uh, is to match the mid-rise definition in the building code to avoid confusion. According to the building code, mid-rise are buildings 
that the highest floor, the highest floor used for human occupancy is 75 feet or less. The building code sets different construction standards and criteria for mid-rise and high-rise. Setting the same high criteria as building code will help to minimize confusion during code enforcement. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, the second criteria is related to the type of streets and abutting development fronts. As long as an abutting development fronts one major surface or a transit corridor street, it is not required to provide a buffer area adjacent to the abutting single family residential house. The intent of this criteria is to encourage high density development along the major corridors instead of local streets where most single family residential house occur. This criteria exempts an abutting development from providing a buffer uh, area when it fronts both a major thoroughfare or transit quarter street uh, and other streets. For example, uh, on the screen, the abutting development fronts three streets. One is a major thoroughfare, the other two are local streets. This development is not required to provide a buffer area at all, even for the adjacent single family homes along the two local streets, because it fronts one major thoroughfare. Next slide, please. The third criteria um, is that abutting developments in major activity centers are not required to provide a buffer area for the adjacent single family residential homes. The main reason is that major activity centers are intentionally created to encourage high density developments. On the screen, the single family residential neighborhood immediately north of the high rise with red star is outside the major activity center boundary. However, since the high rise is within the major activity center, it's not required to provide a buffer area. The fourth and fifth criteria are related to the type of single family residential um, homes eligible for the buffer area protection. Firstly, an abutting development is required to provide a, a buffer area only if it abuts single family residential lots greater than 3,500 square feet. On the screen, the garage and multifamily building are not required to provide a buffer area along the two townhomes because their lot size are less than 3,500 square feet. Next slide, yes. The high rise is not on this screen. Uh, it's not required to provide a buffer area for the adjacent residential homes either. They are condos, not single family residential use as defined by the ordinance. In addition, an abutting development is required to provide a buffer area only if at least 60% of a property line adjacent to single family residential lots greater than 3,500 square feet and the majority of lots are also greater than 3,500 square feet. On the screen, the multifamily development is not required to provide buffer area for the single family home to the west, even though it's not located along a major thoroughfare nor within a major activity center. The reason is that along its western boundary, there's only one single family residential lot greater than 3,500 square feet. The lot boundary is less than 60% of the multifamily development's western property boundary. Now, let's briefly go over the residential buffer area standards. The ordinance requires all abutting developments meeting the five criteria we just went over to provide a buffer area from any side of a property line abutting single family residential use. The minimum width of a buffer area is 30 feet wide if it is adjacent to or take access from a collector street. Um, the minimum width uh, is 40 feet if it is adjacent to or take access from a local street. Within the buffer area, the, there must be a minimum 10 feet wide landscape buffer. Vehicle access and surface parking are allowed within the buffer area, uh, but no structures or cover parking are allowed. Next slide, please. 
So for example, on the screen, the parcel in red boundary is immediately adjacent to a single family residential lot larger than 3,500 square feet. It is an abutting development um, and require a uh, clip please, um, Devon, yeah. Uh, it required to provide a buffer area along its western boundary, um, the, gray, the gray area on the screen. Within the buffer area, there must be a minimum 10 feet wide landscape buffer. The remaining buffer area could serve as a vehicle access or a surface parking lot. However, structures or cover parking are not allowed in this area. So here uh, is another view of the buffer area. The 10 feet landscape buffer shall include an 8 feet tall solid masonry wall or a wooden fence along the property line. It must be permeable cover with no paving or other impervious cover. There should be no mechanical equipment within the landscape buffer. Instead, um, this area should be planted at least one uh, 1 1.5 inch caliper tree for every 20 feet of the length of the property line. Um, here are some major concerns regarding the residential buffer area centers we have heard. One, no buffer areas are required for single family residential use abutting mid rise under 75 feet in height. Two, there is no high limitation for abutting developments. As we all know, City of Houston does not have zoning. It's very challenging um, to enforce building high limitation. This concern was brought to the Walkable Places Committee two years ago. However, the committee decided that it's infeasible to enforce high limitation in the city. Three, um, no buffer areas are required if abutting developments from a major front, a major thoroughfare, or a transit corridor street especially when an abutting development fronts more than one street, um, as long as one of the street is a major thoroughfare or a transit corridor street, um, the a buffer area is not required along the other streets, even though they are not a major thoroughfare or transit corridor street. Um, four, no buffer areas are required, to, uh, required for townhomes and condos adjacent to abutting developments because they are not constructed on single family residential lots larger than 3,500 square feet. These are the major concerns regarding the buffer area standards we have heard from the public. Um, there may not be easy solutions to address these concerns. We are not asking committee members to find solutions and form a consensus today. Instead, we encourage you to think about these concerns in the coming weeks and share your thoughts with us in the January meeting. Uh, next slide, please. So now I'm ready to take any questions and comments regarding the, um, the buffer area standards. Michelle, this is Sunny Garza. Yes. OK, just, um, you know, I, I've already seen a question in the chat from uh, Mr. Miller about the um, the 3,500 square foot and the 60%. Mm -hmm. So I realize that there's certainly criterion that was used to choose that. My question will be that moving forward, do we need to reassess those numbers as, you know, housing stock changes? In other words, are is that 3,500 growing or is it actually shrinking? And, you know, that 60% that we're using at point, I think those are the two numbers that we need to look at to make sure that we are meeting the needs of the community as we move forward. So. I think those two I, those, those two numbers are worthy of more inspection and discussion in our next meeting. Um, thank you uh, for bringing that up. I think that's a great question. So uh, over the time when we visit the ordinance, we review it and we potential issues, uh, we are definitely open to discuss. Uh, hopefully during the next meeting, we will be able to um, address those one by one. Um, at the same time, we will encourage um, the public to share their thoughts uh, via the map tool. Uh, my coworker will introduce shortly um, to let us know your thoughts and bring us some more examples that will help us to develop strategies uh, in the coming few meetings. I also see, sorry, this is Commissioner Clark. Um, I also see a question from 
um, Randy Jones, Commissioner Jones. Uh, Commissioner Jones, did you want to speak or you just wanted your comment typed in for the record? Uh, well, th thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, it was really, I felt like it was not so much uh, a, a structural comment or a suggestion, but simply in the wording, since we're referring to buffer as, as somewhat of a general term, we, we clearly in uh, in the language and in refer to landscape buffers. And I thought, well, do we need to then just carry it further and refer to structural bu buffers since the landscape is within that that zone? Uh, again, it, it's more grammatical than anything, but just I just felt like maybe we needed to clarify a little bit. And that's a great point. Thank you. Yeah, we could look into that. Thank you. Ms. Clark, and, Dr. Yes. Sherry Smith um, would be next with their hand raised. OK, great. Dr. Thank Smith. You. Thank yes. you. Um, my comment actually follows the, the one previous made because my, my question was, what is the underlying rationale of the buffer? Meaning, is it a landscape buffer? Is it a noise buffer? Is it for open space? And I think the understanding the underlying rationale when we talk about a generic buffer, I think it's going to have impact on the, some of the conversations that we have but as the gentleman mentioned before, commissioner mentioned before, is a landscape buffer because that has a different impact than noise or other types of buffers. And I think it's important that we clarify because the impacts are different. Great, thank you. Mr. Curtis Davis would be next. Mr. Davis. Sure, just um, a question for definitions condos and townhomes are those terms used to define a building type or an ownership type for example a single family home that has two units in it that has a form and typology of a single family home but that has an ownership structure that creates a condo where each unit is owned separately would be equally impacted and i guess the question refers to the intent of the definition of condos. And then the other point is you you made a great presentation and from time to time you gave some rationale for why we came to what we came to and there was a question about that. Continue doing that, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, so regarding your questions regarding Tom homes and condos, according to the Code of Ordinance the definition, Tom home is one type of single family residential use. Um, however, um, normally we see the townhomes that are uh, located in the, the lot size is smaller, uh, normally smaller than 3,500 square feet. Condos is a different type and we practically, like when we see the application over the time, we treat condo as multifamily because of the land ownership. So that's why um, the example I show the condos is not County as a single family residential lot. That's why. And definitely, uh, that's what is written in the ordinance now. Uh, we are open to revisit that um, to find an effective way to protect the residential um, homes. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the other part of my question was if a single family home or a building built in the form of a single family home contained multiple units, that would not be eligible under the ordinance, as I understand what you just said. Yes, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank yes. you. Ms. Yen, may I, may I clarify that a little bit or correct me if I'm, this is Director Wallace Brown. I wanna make sure that we're clear that the definition of single family can be two units on a lot. It is either attached duplex that are the same size, so, attached duplex or one home with a secondary structure, an ADU, not to exceed 900 square feet. You are correct. So oh. townhomes could be single family, but they typically aren't, they don't receive the buffer protection because typically they're on less than 3,500 square foot lots. Yes, yes, that's what I said, yeah. May I? This is Vida Bandi, staff. Please yes. go ahead. There was one question also in the chat that where did the 3,500 square feet lot size come from? Mushin, do you want to answer or you want me to go ahead? Um, if you want, you could go ahead. 
Thank you. Um, the 3500 square feet is the requirement of the lot size, the minimum lot size required in the city. 5000 square feet is in the extraterritorial jurisdiction. So that is the current ordinance requirements and that's where 3500 square feet came from. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any more hands raised? Yes, ma'am. Um, Sean Masek. OK, Sean Masek. Yeah, so um, can I stop you for one second? Can can you pronounce your last name and then spell it for the record, please? Sure. Um, and I ask this because we do record these meetings and it's it's for closed captions. So if you would do that, I'd appreciate it. Sure. Since there's five ways to spell Sean these <laughs> as well. S-H-A-W-N for Sean and Massock, M-A-S-S-O-C-K. Great, thank you. Um, so two, two items, one was um, back to question of what kind of buffer to call it. And it se really seems like it's more like a 30 foot or a 40 foot building setback. And within that is the 10 foot landscape buffer. So I don't know if maybe setback might be a better term to use versus calling it a 30 or 40 foot buffer. Um, just a comment really there. But the next was a question I had earlier as you guys were reviewing the major activity centers that there's eight currently. Is there a potential for future uh, max and a process for getting new max created or added within the city? Yes, that's a potential. That's why the ordinance create the criteria for the max. So as long as the area um, qualify for all those criteria, um, they could submit the application and create a new at a major activity center. Okay. That's possible. Thank you. Great, thank you. If I may, this yes. is the Bandy again. I just want to um, respond slightly to the comment about building lines. For the ordinance, building lines are only along a street right of face and not next to adjacent properties. Um, that's the reason right now it's called a buffer because it's the distance between the true structures versus um, a building line, which is distance from the distance of the structure from the right of way. Great, thanks, Savita. Do we have any other raised hands? Ms. Siegler. OK, uh, Ms. Siegler. Yes, thank you. Um, in the case where there's a 5,000 square foot lot and um, three townhouses are building on it, that's less than um, the, the minimum lot size for the city of Houston. So how are the, how would those lots be treated or those um, those type of developments? May I answer the question, Mushin? Sure, go ahead. Yes, if, um, if a 5,000 square feet lot is subdivided into, generally it is divided into three lots with a shared driveway and townhomes are built, so that means the lot sizes are, <clears throat> excuse me, less than 3,500 square feet. With respect to the buffering ordinance, the odd buffering ordinance, um, sorry, the buffering requirement doesn't apply, which we already heard through the presentation. If your question is, when I said the minimum requirement of lot sizes, your question may be, why or how are they being allowed? So chapter 42 has requirements for performance standards based on the square foot, the coverage and the density requirements. So if applicants want to propose less than 3500 square foot lots, then um, they can go ahead and do that up to 14. They can go as low as 1400 square feet lots as long as they meet the 27 dwelling units per acre density and uh, they provide 60% lot coverage only and there is a permeable area requirement of 150 square feet per lot. So they have to meet all those conditions and that is how they go and build less than uh, undeveloped properties with less than 300 square feet. Thank you. I know and I um, I appreciate that answer it, and um, it definitely helped explain it. But I think I was also just curious as because I guess I wanted to think through the process of those those three townhouses are still residential, even though they don't fit the minimum and they could be, which often does happen at the end 
of a residential neighborhood. And so it was just thinking through um, thinking through the logistics of that. Yes, Ms. Sigler, um, the lot sizes are smaller than 3,500 square feet and ordinance allows that and they still qualify for the definition of single family residential. There is also one other requirement that I didn't mention, uh, which is compensating open space. So there are two options to have lots less than 3,500 square feet in the ordinance and they're still single family. One option is what I mentioned with density and lot coverage requirements and the other option is compensating open space requirement. So if you're building smaller lots or developing smaller lots, then you can provide compensating open space reserves um, and have lots smaller. So that is another option. So these two options are available and they are still single family lots. By definition. Thank you. Thank you, Savita. Do we have any other hands raised? Ms. Johanna Mahmoud had her hand raised, but is now lowered, so I don't know if she would like to speak. Ms. Mahmoud, did you want to speak? Uh, no, I'm good now. Thank you. OK, great. Um, I know Mr. Miller, Jack Miller, had asked a question, and we put him, he's in the chat room, and we put him on the list. Mr. Miller, did you want to ask a question? Uh, not at this time. Uh, the question regarding a lot uh, answered for my purposes. I appreciate it. Great, thank you. Okay, if we don't have anybody else, Savita, I guess uh, we go on, move on. Okay, um, go to the next slide, please. Thank you, everyone, for the other two comments. Um, so now let's talk about the garage screening standards. Um, hold on a second. So, I'm sorry. Um, the building code includes very specific garage screening requirements or for all abutting developments in the city. Any part of an abutting development used as a parking garage structure shall provide an exterior cover for each floor of the structure directly facing single family residential um, use. The exterior cover shall be at least 42 inch tall opaque surface sufficient to block headlights. The exterior cover is required to block headlights for ramps and other sloped surface adjacent to single family residential use as well. However, it is not required for a finished floor over 50 feet in height. Here is an exhibit um, illustrating the screening requirements. Um, as you could see, each floor of the garage structure facing single family residential use is installed a 42 inch tall opaque exterior cover. The exterior cover is required for the finished floor less than um, 50 feet from grade. There are two major concerns related to the garage screening requirements. The first concern is that Screening is not required for single family residential use across the street. The reason is that a street in the city is normally 50 feet or wider. The single family residential house across the street are not within 30 feet of the garage structure. Therefore, the garage structure is not an abutting development and is not required to provide screening for the single family residential house across the street. The second concern is that the screening is not required over 50 feet from grade. In other words, um, sixth floor and above are not required to provide screening. In the coming weeks, staff will do more research to explore how other US cities implement garage screening requirements and address these concerns. Uh, meanwhile, we encourage the committee members to share your thoughts with us in the next meeting. Uh, with that said, uh, I'm ready to take any questions or comments um, on the uh, garage screening standards. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Anyone have their hand raised? So far, no hand raised. OK. Um, 
Okay. Well, I think you did such a good presentation. No one has questions. <laughs> okay, thank you. Then uh, let's talk about the lighting fixture standard. Devon, please move to the next slide. Um, so the building code requires full cutoff fixture for all abutting developments located within 30 feet from single family residential houses. Um, the building code has rest, uh, detailed technical requirement for full cutoff fixture to prevent lights from spilling over at all directions. It's required for both wall mounted fixtures and light poles within 30 feet from single family residential houses. Next slide, please. The major lighting fixture concern we have heard is that abutting developments are not required to provide full cut of fixtures when the single family residential house are across the street from the structure. Um, are there any questions, comments for the lighting fixture standards? Shan, Commissioner Garza again. So I yes. seem to recall that uh, when we were, remember that project on West Gray that came before us where the they built a new restaurant, the Dalton, and there's townhomes right behind it. And although there's a parking garage, it's not very high, but you're right. The number one complaint was two was twofold. One was noise but the other was lighting. They seem to have so much light pollution. And the problem I think is that that structure doesn't meet the criteria and it's not 50 feet tall. And uh, I think that might be something we need to consider as we see more mid rises coming in or maybe retail with housing above um, moving into where maybe, um, I don't know, uh, uh, warehousing might be today like in the East End. I think we're gonna have more and more of these things coming up where they would normally be exempt, but I think it's something that we might want to look at from a lighting standpoint, because if that light is a Klieg light, everyone sees it for, you know, <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of feet all the way around. So mm -hmm. I think that is your right. I think that's something we need to maybe take a second full look at and make some decisions on how to apply those fixtures where we need them and where we don't. Very good points. Well, that is a good point, Sonny. And I mean, there there are ways that you can shield that light. It doesn't have to be a full cut off. It could have a partial cut, you know, on the side where the residents are. So I think there's some options uh, to be looked at. Um, let's see. I thought I saw a question, but I, I think it's been answered. No, let's figure out this bit. Garage light is amazing. Okay, do I have any hands raised? I know I have a question or two in the chat room. Mr. Curtis Davis has his hand raised and then uh, Mr. Masek at, asked the question about the definition of full cutoff, which Mushan put in the chat. Yep, I saw that. Okay, great. Um, Mr. Davis? Yeah, I, I think this light <clears throat> lighting issue is a good example of something we need to think about throughout in terms of the relationship between ordinances themselves and the codes. And in this case, in terms of the buffer zone discussion that we're having, it can be described in terms of static conditions, that is the massing, physical setbacks, and the like, and dynamic conditions, lighting, smells, sound, you know, acoustic things. And one can also go into aesthetic conditions that deal with character um, and so on. So as we think about the specific and discrete elements of the ordinance, I, I think one of the things that this is an opportunity to begin to think about all of our guidance as a whole, and that when we make a specific ordinance around a discrete element like this lighting, one needs to think about it in a dynamic condition in terms of all of its impacts, in terms of light pollution and so on. Uh, glare, you know, if light levels are higher than another level, you can affect blind yourself, blind someone and, and so on. So as we go forward, if we could begin to catalog or at least capture these issues and think about how they map across our various ordinances so that we can provide a holistic approach and some clarity on all these matters. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And then I, I believe you told me Sean Masick had some questions or had at least been in the chat room, I believe. Sean, did you have anything additional you needed? Yeah, so they answered the full cutoff fixture definition, but I just also sent another one wondering if there was 
if you guys were defining the maximum height from the ground to the fixture itself, whether it's pole mounted or wall mounted, because it seems like there's really two concerns there. One is seeing the fixture, i.e. a glare bomb, you know, for the residential neighbors. Second, that the light is, you know, possibly crossing the property line or lot line and is lighting up their backyard area. So I'm not sure if just having full cutoff fixtures addresses the second of the light crossing the property line. I've worked in a lot of areas with dark sky stuff, so. <laughs> right. Very good. We'll if I may answer the question, Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am, Savita. Uh, the cutoff fixtures requirement again goes back to the definition of the voting development. Uh, that means a development that is within 30 feet of the single family residential developments. So within that 30 feet, if somebody is proposing pole uh, lights on the pole or um, on the structure, they have to have the cutoff fixtures. If it is away from the 30 feet distance from the single family, then there is no requirement. To answer your other question, is there a maximum height from the ground to the fixture? That is not defined in the ordinance, so the answer is no at this time. But if you want to consider that, that is something we should look at. Cutoff fixtures generally, what they do is they allow the light to focus at one place instead of it beaming in all directions. Um, that's the purpose of the cutoff fixtures. Usually, the, in, in other places I've worked, uh, usually the cutoff fixtures will read about light bleed up into the sky and um, not necessarily so so if it's a fit 30 feet from the property line or with within that it's 20 or 50 feet in the air it's still providing a whole bunch of light on that resonance so I'm, okay. I'm just trying to get to the root of i guess the purpose for the the ordinance in the first place and if it's really light on the single family lot i'm not sure that's what it's getting um. at if I could, this is Musian. The, the full cut of lighting fixture, the definition was created by the residential buffering ordinance to try to adjust this, try to provide some sort of protection for the adjacent residential neighborhood. But we do hear what you're saying. Um, definitely, we will need more your input uh, when we develop uh, the better solution uh, down the road. Great, thank you. Um, I see a question in the chat room from Mike Dishberger asking, are there light standards on just single family homes that prohibit similar lights or is this just for the buffering standards? So the lighting uh, fixture requirement is only for the abutting development, not for the single family residential use. OK, great. Uh, Mike, did you have anything further than that or was that your oh. only question? No, the only, the only comment I was trying to make is we're, uh, we've set standards for uh, a mid-rise that has light shining in a single family. I'm sure there's a lot of people in Houston that have their neighbors lights with similar lights shining in their backyards and through their same windows. I, I don't think like you're going there on this. Just want to make sure we're just doing the operating standard. Great, thank you. Ms. Clark, you did have several committee members join the meeting after you took role. I don't know if you wanted to acknowledge them audibly during the meeting and have them acknowledge that they've been participating or that they're participating at this time. Absolutely, we can have them acknowledge. Um, I don't know who's out there, so um, state your last name and that you're present, please. Uh, John Blunt, present. Great, thank you, John. Have you been with us for a while, John, or just did you just join? Uh, for about an hour. Oh, OK. Um, almost the whole time. I just didn't I had trouble getting in. OK, great. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and Madam Chair, this is Vida Bandy. Miss um, Sandra Stevens uh, has her hand raised up, I thought, a few minutes ago. OK, do I have anyone else that joined the meeting that we haven't recognized? OK, Ms. Stevens. Yes, I just want to underscore what Mr. Davis said earlier about light. And, uh, you know, uh, we're looking at some very specific ordinances that are currently in place, but light is dynamic and there.
there is um, concerns about lighting that escapes from parking garages, for example. Um, when you talk about ceiling fixtures within those parking garages and your screening is only, what, 42 inches high. So I hope we'll be looking at the big picture, so to speak, uh, beyond just uh, headlights of cars driving through the garages. It's a big, it's a big issue. Great. Yeah, it, it, lighting always is a big issue. I appreciate your comments. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any other hands raised? No, ma'am. Okay, I, I do know there's an unknown user that, let's see, maybe it's Cindy Woods. Uh, Miss Woods, did you want to ask a question or did you just want your comments in the chat room for the record? Just the comments, it's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, if we have no one else, let's move on. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please, Devon. Um, the residential buffering ordinance does not include noise control standards because the noise control standards were addressed by a separate ordinance um, prior to the residential buffer ordinance in 2011. Um, and it was decided that all noise control standards are enforced by the police department. The noise and sound level regulation is written in Chapter 30. Uh, of the Code of Ordinance. Uh, it provides some general guidance related to noise and establish uh, maximum permissible sound levels as well as method of sound measurement. Next slide, please. Um, there are three major noise related concerns we have heard. There are noise from the adjacent uh, commercial use, like bars, restaurants, etc. Um, building equipment noise and dumpster noise. These are the concerns um, we have heard for developments other than mid-rise and high-rise as well. Um, here is a quick summary uh, uh, for when the three different buffering standards apply to a button development for your reference. Um, do you have any, next slide please, questions or comments regarding the noise control standards before we move to the next session. Oh, I have a comment on this one. Um, and I don't know how we could address it, but it's just a, a comment. I know that when you're trying to meet the noise standards, you're doing your testing. The testing is very difficult. You have to hire a sound engineer and you have to pay them for travel. And so they travel to the site, they do their testing the sound is not being made at the time, they go away, you have to call them back when the noise starts again. And it's probably about a $1,200 trip every time they come. So I don't know what we can do about it. It's just a comment. It just is very difficult when it's an intermittent sound that is pretty constant, but not, not completely constant and it's hard to catch, um, but is yet very disturbing to the quality of life. So just some comments on, on that. Do we have any raised hands? Uh, uh, Commissioner Guards again. Yes, sir. You know, I, I should let you run this meeting, Lisa, instead of like keep butting in, but I do have another I know. Question. Where's that <laughs> <Right>. button? <laughs> so uh, again, I go back to um, a mid-rise apartments being built. And uh, if you recall, Lisa, we were both in that um, that planning commission meeting and the idea was they wanted the, there was it was backing up to a neighborhood of single family housing there was a narrow street and they were going to be bringing their dumpsters and their building material and everything in on that back street when they actually could have been coming in. I believe it was like on Ella, a major thoroughfare. So what we're talking about right now doesn't really touch that. But I wonder if in when we're talking about people, uh, this, I don't know if this would be per. I mean, I don't we don't we don't want to get into architecture. I understand that. But it seems to me like if you have a a big building of any sort and you're going to have big trucks coming in and out of there you should have to come through a major thoroughfare versus a neighborhood you know a neighborhood street that maybe has less than 20 feet of paving and Mushan, i don't know how we would put that in an ordinance or where that would fit it, it might it's probably outside the purview of this committee but i think that that's might be something that we can consider from a design standpoint versus 
this ordinance versus noise. We can't really affect that, but I think we certainly can affect saying you can't drive through a tiny neighborhood with a, a giant a giant truck a dumpster at you know six o'clock six o'clock in the morning when you have access to do say Ella. So we might want to take that into consideration and see where we might apply that that uh, that information and what part of the ordinance it might work best in. Thank you. No, those are good comments, Sonny, and I do remember um, I do remember that, and that is difficult. And I, I, I'm with you. I'm not sure how we would address it, but I do think if the option of being accessing a major thoroughfare versus a residential neighborhood is available, that should be something that that we look at. So thank you. Um, I see another hand. I just don't know who. Miss Mahmoud would be first. Okay, Miss Mahmoud. Uh Yes, I was uh, just uh, looking at the print uh, ordinance and uh, is that me making that noise? I don't know. I'm not sure if it's you or if it's just we have too many mics on. Let's. OK, so. Um, thinking about that ordinance in terms of the lighting protection with lighting um, and also buffering from noise, looking at the ordinance right now, we have like a one tree every 20 feet. Um, and perhaps in terms of resilience and protection from light and protection from noise, trees could be something that maybe we could consider uh, beefing up in that section of the of the buffer and it may be a certain caliper tree um, and, and you know becoming up like every five feet or, or however depending on the species and all of that but sort of like lining that up with the with the uh, ordinance that allows um, or the you know the trees that are allowed by the city of Houston but Maybe considering that as uh, as one of effective measure that maybe it's a requirement for the buffering that it could sort of um, <clears throat> hit those uh, check marks in a way. And it's just a general comment. We appreciate it. Thank you. Tammy? Mr. Davis is next. Okay, Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis, please unmute yourself to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a recommendation to staff. Having um, the information in a tabular form is very helpful. Um, and as we go through these um, categories, looking across ordinances and within an ordinance tab in a tabular form where we can begin to see where things are redundant or not is very helpful. And in the case of, of these dynamic issues like sound, noise, smell, visual, care, uh, history, and all that, um, if we can categorize them as nuisance versus character defining. So there's some things that relate to those issues of noise and light and sound and smell that inform the character of an area and the and and and, and impact um, enjoyment use for a particular type of use, like in a backyard. And then there are others that are just flat out nuisances. And if we can begin to categorize that and see where we are regulating nuisance and where we are facilitating character, uh, that would be helpful. And for the development community, that would help to for this to begin to be a little bit more whole so people don't feel like they're a thousand, you're dying by a death of a thousand cuts of trying to go through many, many different things that touch on the same topic in different ways. Great, thank you. Tammy. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just want to I say echo or support uh, Commissioner Garza's comment about service drives. If you recall in a uh, prior planning commission meeting that the proposed redevelopment of, of a property in the southwest region of Allen Parkway in, in Nawa, uh, uh, if I believe that correct. Just anyway, and the residents who chimed in were very vocal about service drive and garbage uh, truck pickup coming uh, off of a rear side street right across the front of, of uh, their properties. And it was a, a densely developed uh, residential area. And when I say that, you know, I would say probably, you know, five foot front setback, maybe 10, uh, three foot side setback, uh, you know, very dense. So I, I again, I just think that Mr. Garza, Commissioner Garza's comment is on point. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Tammy. 
there are no other hand raised. OK, I did see Mr. Furrow, I believe, wanted to speak. Was it this topic that you wanted to speak on, Mr. Furrow, that you had a question? Madam Chair, if I may interrupt, this is Savita Bandi. Yes. Um, he is one of the public speakers and we'll have OK, the OK, got it. Thank you. OK, do we have any more questions? Hands up. All right, let's move on. OK, if there are no more comments, uh, my co-worker Lynn Hansen will introduce an interactive map tool to you. The map tool provides a platform for residents to provide comments for the existing developments in the city and help us identify the needs for ordinance amendments to guide the city growth sustainably. Um, this concludes my presentation. Now let's turn to Lin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Can I get control? Yes, please, Mushen. You um, sorry. Yes, please, Lynn. You can take over the screen. Um, it says I didn't get control. Um, I still Lynn, see the presentation on the screen. You can just share your screen and that will override the current share screen. It should just override it. I don't see the options for me to click the website. OK. You OK, uh, Devin is actually doing the presentation for me. I can go to the website for you and then I can share. OK, while you're doing that, I'll go ahead and just start the discussion. OK, sure. Thank you and good afternoon, co-chairs and committee members. The presentation today has been focused on the buffering ordinance. In order to support the committee's discussions and work related to the buffering ordinance, we've created a community engagement tool to capture comments, ideas and recommendations from the public. The online mappable survey tool may be found on letstalkhouston.org. And if you scroll down to the map bar that you see on the screen, the dark blue tab is on map it. I want to point out that next to the link that says effects of tall structures near single family homes are four black buttons. Those buttons are there for you to share the survey tool with friends, neighbors, relatives, any groups or social groups that you may uh, interact with. If you click on the link for effects of tall structures in your single family homes, that will start the survey. We would like the committee as well as the committee, the community in general to tell us what you've experienced, why it works or why it doesn't work. By doing this, you can click on the circle with the plus sign. And a box will pop up. And I'll, I'll keep talking while while you sign in. A box will pop up to start the survey. If you know where the location is and you're familiar with mapping, you can zoom in or zoom out on the map and drag the screen to the location of the development you'd like to comment on. If you don't know where the location is or, or are unfamiliar with navigating this way, on the right side, there is a magnifying glass and you can actually type the address of a specific location and the map will take you there. For example, 611 Walker or. On the left, you'll see two pins. Those pins are different colors. The green is for development that fits nicely. These are developments that you'd want to comment on the good qualities of their development. The orange 
identifies development that needs improvement or that you'd like to make recommendations on. You can drag either of those and drop them on the map and it will start these additional questions. You can comment at any time and tell us whatever you'd like to. You can upload a picture by clicking the blue add image button. And there are questions under the add image button. The first asks how many floors are in this building? This is just an estimate. You can type the actual number or with text. The second question is what does the structure have that may help mitigate impacts? There are some pre-selected choices in this drop down menu that you can select. The third question is which of these causes you the greatest concern? Again, there are pre-selected choices in the drop down that you can click. If there if you'd like to make a comment that are that is not in this drop down list, you can add that to the comment section. Once you've finished, hit submit. And your comments and your pin will be added to the map. This survey tool will be open through January and the results of this survey will be given to the, co the committee. Again, I really urge the committee members as well as the public in general to forward this survey to um, anyone that you feel that might want to comment on, uh, on this tool activity. Thank you, that ends my presentation. If there are any questions, I can answer any questions. Ms. Stevens has her hand raised. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Uh, I just want you to clarify, you said through January. You mean through the end of January? When I published this um, to my contacts, I wanted to be clear about that. Ms. Stevens, may I answer the question? Um, uh, Madam Chair, may I answer the question? Yes, you may. Go ahead. Oh, right now, the plan is to have this tool available until the 1st of January, and the results of the tool be presented to the committee at the January 12th uh, committee meeting. However, based upon the need, the, we, we may decide to accept Now it is January 1st. Okay. Um, let me ask you a question. Have we, are we going to send out maybe an email to our committee members to give them this link to share, make it a little bit easier than them having to create things on their own? Have we thought about that? We have sent an email um, to all the committee members with um, information of the link and the, all the website information. If you sent that earlier today or tell me when you sent that. Um, Friday. OK, great. That's, yeah, in the evening. OK, so if, if the committee members, if you guys could just uh, retrieve that email, I think it would make your job of notifying um, those of interest. It would be easier for you. I can send one more email, uh, Madam Chair, if that makes it simple. Um, I, I was thinking it would just make it more simple for people and um, give them the direction and the link, and then that way they can then just share it and not have to type up an email. Sure, we can do that. We can create a uh, prepped up email, prepared email already and send it to the committee members. Great, thank you. OK, do we have uh, any more hands raised? No, ma'am. OK, great, thank you. Thank you. So Savita, I think you're up. Thanks, OK, so um, Devin, can we go back to the presentation? Um, on the agenda right now, what we have is the next steps. So the, uh, during the next meeting, we will um, come back and discuss and look at the concerns that some of the concerns that we heard today. And um, there will be more brainstorming with the committee members as what should we address? What did we learn from other cities? and what is the outcome of um, the survey tool that we put out there. So basically we will be able to um, understand even the public's 
uh, get the public's input and make that part of the uh, whole process. The next committee meeting is scheduled for January 12th from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. I also wanted to announce that the next historic, um, sorry, the next conservation district focus group meeting is scheduled for December 18th at 10.30 a.m. And that invite will go out sometime today or tomorrow morning. Great, thank you. With that, we conclude the next steps. Uh, this is the contact information. If any one of you or the public has any questions and would like to reach me, please note down the email address. It is livableplaces at houstontx.gov. And the phone number to reach us is 832-393-6600. And I request everyone to participate actively in the tool and share it with all your friends. And um, let's make sure that we have good input to make this a success. Thank you all. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we'll open public comments. Tammy, can you tell me in order uh, who who has questions? Omero is actually covering. Madam Chair, this is okay. Yeah, this is Omero Guajardo, Planning Department. We have four speakers. First speaker is Barbara McGuffey. Okay, Barbara. Hi, I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? You're unmuted. I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, so first of all, I want to say that we have, um, I'm, I'm from Museum Park, and we're very grateful to have the committee address this issue. We raised it repeatedly, as many of you got tired of hearing us at the, on the tech, on the transit oriented development ordinances. Um, so it's very important to Museum Park. And I, I just want to say that I think, you know, the, the residential buffering ordinance does not go far enough. If you, you know, I live in a townhome, which is single family residential. And as we encourage higher density development in our neighborhoods, and we considered Museum Park a neighborhood still, um, we, we have major concerns that there's no buffering from across the street. And we've started to see at how, high rise, how high rises affect us. In fact, on January the 24th, 2017, a group of us spoke at city council on just this topic and said uh, and raised many of these same issues um, at that time about problems that we saw. And it has, you know, so it's high time we get all this addressed. Um, I, I do want to point out one thing before I lose my time here that that is very important to us. The transit corridor exemption and the major thoroughfare exemption. When you think about Museum Park, we have many townhomes and single family residences that are on the backside of a block where the, the higher density development faces the major thoroughfare or a transit corridor street. And those, those are not protected uh, at all from any buffering. So we really need to change that um, to make a, make a change there, not so much on the front of the street, but on the back side where it engages with, uh, with single family residential. And we started actually calling it a buffering ordinance and not just residential. Your time has ordinance. expired. Ms. McGuffey, if you could wrap up, please. Okay, thank you. We started calling it a buffering ordinance as opposed to just a residential buffering ordinance for just the reason that you all have said. Um, when you limit to single family residential, it doesn't protect someone who lives in a condo. It doesn't protect someone who lives in an apartment. Um, we think that you know there should just be design standards. Many buildings have beautiful garages if you drive around. Um, they have beautiful garages where you would never even know that the first floors were a garage. Not here. In Museum Park, we, we don't have that. And a lot of places in the city don't have that. So I think it's very important to look at garage screening. It's very important to look at lighting. Um, we, we are just as concerned about the lighting fixtures in the garage as we are about the headlights because you right. know, right. we're way too far out into our neighborhood. Thank you for the extra time. Thank you, Ms. McGuffey. Next, next, next speaker is Jack Lou. Jack Lou is is that what you is that what I heard? Mr. Lou. Correct. Jack okay. Lou. Jack. Can you hear me? 
Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, uh, livable places require flood resilience, for clean air, and green space to relax. Multi use channels can achieve these goals. The multi use channel use reinforced concrete box covered to retain banks, create maximum space for water convenience, and uh, support a road inside the channel for public transit uh, or trail during normal weather. During extreme weather, the entire space is available for water convenience. The city is working on North Canal High Flow Channel project. This channel can be built with a trail atop the concrete box covered. It offers maximum convenience capacity within the limited space and connect the existing bio trails. The box covered offers enclosed paths. If it is used for wastewater, the rain water can be desilted and flow in the open channel. The boating service can also be established. Houston downtown could have a river walk that is more spectacular than San Antonio's. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Liu. Next speaker is Jack Miller. Uh, his answer was, his question was answered earlier, but I don't know if he wants to add yeah, another okay. comment. We'll see if he has any other comments, Mr. Miller. Jack Miller, did you have any further comments? Oh, hi, Mero. I believe he does not. <laughs> okay. Last speaker is Dale Furrow. Hi, this is Dale Furrow, F U R R O W. Just a few brief comments. I live across the street from the 13 story uh, Boone Manor project, so this is a personal issue to me. Uh, we have uh, obviously an issue with a single family residence definition. Um, we have six homes on a 100 by 100 foot lot in the middle of the street. None of us have any protection uh, via the current ordinance. Uh, I'd like to uh, reinforce what Mr. Davis said uh, as I sort of understood what he was talking about, the, that we're talking about performance standards here in terms of the ability of one development to impose upon a single family residence and i really don't see why we can't write the ordinance in that uh, or correct the ordinance in that manner the next comment i have is uh construction uh we're experiencing that uh, live right now in museum park but i think the standards that we eventually settle on ought to uh, have the full life of the property including construction uh is, is some form of uh, contemplation of, of how the the ordinance ought to go. And finally, penalties, right? If we do buffering right, there should be no need of civil litigation or civil settlement. Um, so far in Museum Park, we've had three major projects. I'm aware of uh, civil settlements or litigation being uh, either executed or contemplated in two of those. I would argue that every time that happens is a policy failure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Furrow. Mero, I believe I saw someone else wanted to speak. Correct. Yeah, there is another speaker. His name is Mark Williamson. Mr. Williamson. Thank you, Mark Williamson. Uh, I live in Houston Heights area. I had a couple of general comments about uh, lighting and about angle versus building height. The There are a number of places where light spills are happening that are uh, much worse or well that are as bad in, as in resi into residential neighborhoods there are lots of places around town where uh, parking lot lights for example are spilling into freeways and affecting the ability of drivers to continue I'd, either we don't have adequate rules against that or they're not being adequately enforced uh, lights need an angle component if the light is further is higher, it needs to have a better shielding. And that's also true of buildings. If a building is taller, it needs a bigger buffer. And those are the general comments I wanted to introduce. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williamson. We appreciate that. Amaro, do we have anyone else or was that the last speaker? That was the last speaker. No more speakers on the list. Thank you. Thank you. Savita, do you have anything else that you'd like to say? 
before I adjourn. Oh, Madam Chair, there was one question in the chat window about the buffering residential buffering ordinance focus group that we discussed originally in the beginning of the local places project. Yes, um, I would like to uh, address that comment. Yes, please go ahead. Because there is so much interest and so much input um, from the committee, all the members within the committee um, wanted to participate in this residential um, buffering amendments. Uh, committee leadership has decided that we will continue with this being committee's work. And if there is a need while we go through the solutions, if there is a need, committee will decide to call on a focus group. So I just wanted to um, let the speaker know about that information. Great. Now that's good information because you're right. We did talk about forming um, a focus group and and I remember when we mentioned that uh, the majority of the committee members wanted to, to be part of it. So um, I think that's the best way to handle it. And if we need to break off and have particular subjects, you know, reviewed outside of this committee, you know, we, we could do that in the future. So thank you. And if there's nothing else, I'm going to go ahead and close the meeting and thank everyone for participating. And thank you to all the committee members for uh, two of your valuable hours uh, to go over all of this information and to work with us on these issues. Thank you yes, so much, thank everyone. It's a pleasure. Staff, is there anything else? Yeah. Thank you thank very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sunny. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. See you next time. All right. You.